This is Splice. You're listening to a recorded session from Splice Beta 2022 in Chiang Mai. We've edited this, but only slightly. Hey, this is Alan from Splice. You're listening to a session with Nishan Lilwani, the CEO of the International Fund for Public Interest Media, on what he wants to see in a great grant application. I'm the CEO of the International Fund for Public Interest Media. Some people struggle with my name, Nishan Lilwani. You can call me Nish. Everyone struggles with the International Fund for Public Interest Media. <laughs> I just want to address the elephant in the room, which is our, our name. And you call it IFCO for short. When we were starting to work on the concept for the International Fund for Public Interest Media um, about four or five years ago, we had this idea that we needed a global fund for journalism supported by governments, corporates, and philanthropy in order to radically increase the amount of money to come in to support independent media organizations like the ones in this room. Um, and we thought, you know, we'll, it's not a good name, but let's just say what it does on the tin. And then later we'll figure out a better name. You know, we're so far from getting any money and you know, actually getting this off the ground. And then in December of last year, at the Summit for Democracy, um, President Biden and President Macron and Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern um, Minister Audrey Tang of Taiwan, the Korean, the Korean um, Prime Minister, all publicly used our name when announcing support, and so now we're stuck with it. Uh, <laughs> so that's why we're called the International Fund for Public Interest Media. But it is a name that we've grown to be proud of, because we think that it represents the high-level financial and political momentum that we've been able to get for the cause of independent media. We think that it represents a community um, with momentum of those who want to address the problems we're facing in the space. Uh, and we also hope that it is a genuinely global approach to tackling the issues in our sector. Not just a global north approach, but a genuinely global approach to tackling the issues in our sector. And I'll talk a bit more about what we're trying to do. If PIM is, it is a new multilateral and independent fund to support trustworthy journalism, to enable those who want to support journalism to reduce both the political costs and transaction costs of doing so. Um, I don't think that Taiwan have done very much international media funding, for example, but they are a contributor to our fund. We want to become an organization that helps surface and share what works, and ultimately help with the support of many others in this space, of course, to support uh, journalism to a new paradigm within the next 10 years. That's a very ambitious goal. There are many people who have been working on this for a long time. We're not suggesting that we have the answers. But we, we are hoping that working together, that we can act quickly and at scale to, to make this happen. One of the ways in which we want to do this is to radically increase the amount of money available for independent media in Latin America, Africa, uh, Asia, and Eastern Europe. We're working in those regions. Um, and our goal, which actually we share with other media development organizations like IMS, Internews, and uh, Deutsche Welle and others, is to try and increase the amount of foreign aid going to media to be 1% of all foreign aid. Right now, it's 0.3%, um, which is about $500 million a year, US dollars. When you think about how important a democracy is, to many of the countries who have large amounts of money and deploy it foreign aid, and how little gets spent on media. 0.3% is extraordinarily low. You know, many large governments and politicians and corporates are concerned about misinformation, they're concerned about the eroding for the state, they're concerned about the impact that it's having on all of our democracies and societies. And yet, one, so 1% 1 doesn't feel like an unattainable goal. That would be an extra billion dollars every year going into this space. And while we understand that money is not the only thing, it's not sufficient to solve this problem, we do think it's necessary to solve this problem. Um, in terms of objectives for today, I'm going to be super quick, tell you a bit about FPIM, mainly because we're really new and most people haven't heard of us yet. I'm then going to talk a little bit, as the title of the session indicates, on what we think is important when it comes to funding. But then I'd actually like to leave uh, most of the time uh, open for a discussion 
um, to understand your feedback on what we're trying to achieve, whether what we're missing, whether we can make our grant processes and criteria more relevant to you, and addressing real needs in your context. My main objective is not to tell you um, what a good grant application looks like, but actually to hear from you um, what it should look like. Our board chairs, the chairs of our, our management board, are Maria Ressa, who I don't think needs an introduction in this room, and also Mark Thompson, who's the former CEO of the New York Times, he oversaw the digital transformation, and also the former director general of the BBC for many years. They've said that without access to trustworthy, independent news, populations are left in the dark, governments grow corrupt, and democratic institutions soon become a sham. I know you don't need to hear this, but I'm telling you this because this is the rationale, I think, which has most resonated with some of the governments that we've been talking to about funding and with some of the other philanthropies and organizations. They are most concerned about the impact on democracy. I think that's what's changed from maybe five or ten years ago when it comes to the funding environment for media. We are also fundraising, as I mentioned, from, from corporates and philanthropy, and I'll talk a little bit about who those funders are. But we think it needs a real cross-sector solution here in order for us to make a meaningful dent on this problem. And we managed to get some political support over the years. John Kafour, who's the former president of Ghana, wrote the foreword to our initial uh, feasibility study. He's been a huge advocate. The UN Secretary General last year called on all UN member states to contribute to what he called a vital new endeavor. I've talked a bit about um, President Biden. Uh, we were sort of an, a marquee initiative, he called it, at, um, at the Summit of Democracy last year. The next summit is planned for 2023. And that's actually where we hope to launch. If Pim and begin our grant making, we'll be at the Paris Peace Forum with Emmanuel Macron uh, next week, at the end of next week in Paris. And they've, uh, they've also promised support. A few of our other funders, I'm sure you'll recognize these uh, as a mix of old and new funders in media, but aside from USAID, New Zealand, Estonian, Taiwanese, Swiss, Swedish governments, we also have Illuminate, the MacArthur Foundation, Google, Microsoft, uh, and also um, the Ford Foundation, who announced a commitment of $5 million last year. In, in all of these instances, we have asked for new allocations of funding. We want to try and be additive in this space. USAID made it very clear that this is an addition to their existing funding in media. The Ford Foundation tend not to do any international journalism funding. They only focus in the US. And so them giving us money is essentially new funding for journalism outside the US. And we hope the same is true for many of the organizations on that list. In terms of where we are in our development, we're still very early. We've been working on this idea for a number of years. I first spoke about IFPIM in 2019 at the Global Media Freedom Conference with Sunny Sui, who's here in Chiang Mai this week, and Maria as well, Maria Ressa among others. We did a panel back then testing the idea of the fund. That was pre-COVID many, many years ago. But during the pandemic, um, we had a lot of consultation we had an advisory group with people from all over the world who were providing us advice on how to change things, how best to do things. Massive thanks to Alan, actually Alan Soon, who was on our advisory group at that time. We raised a small amount of money there, one and a half million, and that we went to existing media funders like Luminate and MacArthur because they understood the need. But then all the money we've raised since we've tried to ensure is money from those who don't support journalism internationally or are allocating new money to do so. And our goal is to launch if PIM in quarter one of next year, hopefully by March or maybe April at the latest, and we hope to have raised $60 million by that point. And that's not a, a lot of money in the big scheme of things, but it does allow us a couple of years of runway to be able to showcase what we think a genuinely independent multilateral approach to funding media looks like in the, in the, con in the context I mentioned. If that works, then we hope to help get to that much larger amount, the 1% of ODA, not all of that needs to come by FPIM. We hope it goes by many different organizations, but that would be the hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars that we think are actually required to make a dent on this problem. In terms of what we'll be doing, um, we'll be doing direct grant making to media organizations. We'll be looking to do shared ventures with uh, develop media development organizations. We're not trying to replace or disrupt existing organizations. We're trying to add to them. That's why we're sponsoring Splice this week because we think Alan and Richard and what they're doing is fantastic, as is the rest of the team, and we want to be able to support organizations like this one who are, who are actively working on, on media development to, to, to expand that.
we want to be able to provide the kind of support that media organizations need around sustainability, organizational development, and so on. And we want policy and research partnerships to take place so that we can, uh, for example, we'll be talking to the government of Sierra Leone, among others, about national funds for journalism, what they might look like, how they might be governed, how they might be funded. And so we want to go beyond the support of media organizations directly, but actually look at systemic solutions that can help, that can help really move this, this space forward. I won't talk about all of our values, but the top one in the middle there is especially important to us, which is that we are interested in ensuring that the decisions we make as a fund about who to support and how to support them are truly led by the, the needs in the local context. Alan this morning was talking about how you listen, you really need to listen to your audience and really deeply understand their needs. And we believe that's absolutely true. And we, you know, our audience is largely media, independent media organizations. We want to truly invest in understanding the needs that are out there. And that starts, I think, with hiring people with lived experience from the regions in which we're working. So we're hiring at the moment for a regional director for South and Southeast Asia. If you know any good candidates, please let me know. They will be responsible for deploying IFPIM's budget, choosing which countries are best to operate in. And we're looking across the region, so it doesn't matter where people are located. So come and find me if you know a good candidate, or even if you're interested. We also uh, want to ensure that we are supporting organizations in a way that doesn't constrain or limit their growth. So we're providing core funding insofar as we can, and every grant that we do, we'll be looking to provide as unrestricted funding as is possible. We did um, a small open call proposals already, which launched on World Press Freedom Day on May 3rd this year. Um, we did that because we're new, and we're also a startup like many of the organizations in this room. And we need to learn about how to grant make and work with partners effectively. Uh, until two months ago, I led uh, the independent media grant making globally at Luminate, which is a philanthropy funded by the Amidyar Group. So I've been doing this for a few years. We've, we, have, we have people from BBC Media Action on the team. We have people from Internews on the team. So we have some expertise from different organizations who've done this for a while. But we do want to try and be the best organization we can be. And part of that is learning by doing. So we had a small amount of money we already received this year, just a few million dollars. And we did an open call for proposal in these 17 countries. These countries are not indicative of where we'll be working in the future. I should say that. We chose these countries because we wanted to learn. And of course, the challenges you face in Nepal are completely different from those being faced in either Malaysia or Afghanistan. And so by working in, in quite different countries in this first open call, we feel that we can start to learn about whether our criteria genuinely applies across different countries, what else we need to learn in order to, to launch successfully next year. Because we'll only start grant making really when, when we launch in March or April, once we've raised you know, our, our initial capital. I know some of the organizations in the room applied for this funding. We have to get back to you very quickly if we haven't already. We're a very small team at the moment, just a few permanent staff. We are trying to, trying to get the funds out as quickly as possible and promise to do so with most of these organizations in the next couple of months. So what makes a great grant application? There's lots of assumptions one can make here, but we decided to start by actually trying to gather as much data on this as possible and as I mentioned earlier, I'd like to use this session as well to try and gather data on what you all think is the right way to approach the problem if you were in my shoes. It's obvious that we're facing a crisis when it comes to financial support for media. And I know you all have felt this much more acutely than I have. But if you look at the data, um, and this is the data that's resonated again as we've been, we've been fundraising, this is from the Journalism and the Pandemic Project done by ICFJ. 80% of media organizations out of the 1,400 they surveyed from 125 different countries, 80% were in critical need of emergency support for operational costs. 40% of those organizations had lost more than half of their revenue, which I find astonishing that, that many of them are still uh, are keeping afloat. And if you look at global newspaper revenues in 2020, 30 billion US dollars were lost to global newspaper revenue. When we started working on this, a lot of people said, you're trying to raise a billion dollars, you're crazy. And I said, well, a billion dollars isn't enough, because $30 billion were lost only in one year 
in newspaper revenues. And you all know what's been happening over the last 20 years, the losses have been actually far, far greater than that. So clearly, we need to address the financial needs in the market. We also did a survey with the Global Forum for Media Development and tried to understand what the needs were there. That, that survey I can send to you. you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting data there. Too much to go through to today, but it was 173 respondents in GFMD countries. Emergency core support was a, was a key need. Two-year funding, at, at a minimum, was also a request. A lot of organizations were actually requesting partnership with it around learning or support. We're not really in a position to do that yet, but we hope to be because this need has been identified. We also asked about how we should choose organizations to support. 80% of respondents said that editorial independence, professional standards are actually uh, an important way of doing that. And so we're piloting a partnership with the Journalism Trust Initiative, which is an initiative of reports without borders to try and figure out certified organizations when it comes to these standards as well. So this is what the data we gathered in terms of the surveys that we've done, the data that others have done, like ICFJ. We also ha have noticed that a couple of problems, other than the huge financial problems, there's a couple of other problems that are common across Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe. The first is exclusion in newsrooms, in sources, subjects, and staff. And globally, only 25% of sources and subjects are women. I'll acknowledge, by the way, that when we talk about exclusion, we're not only talking about women, but I'm just using some of the data here to show one angle of that, which is, um, which is gender diversity. Women are clearly underrepresented in newsrooms across all of those, not just across those countries, but in the US and Europe as well, of course. ICFJ's work and Julie Pozzetti's work showed that journalists were increasingly at risk during the pandemic and that they felt the impact of the pandemic more heavily as well, both financially and in terms of safety. So just coming from a session on gender, I know that I'm not alone in thinking that this should be a priority for our fund, and it will be in terms of how we think about evaluating applicants for funding. And so we'll be looking to ensure that those we, we do grants to have diverse newsrooms, for example, and have newsrooms that are representative of the audiences that they're hoping to serve. The second thing that's clearly in common is the lack of trust and engagement that young people have with news across the countries I mentioned, across the continents I mentioned. So in many of the countries in which we're looking to work, the number of young people numbers more than half of the population. It's a huge problem, not just for media, but for democracy, if young people are not engaging in informed public debate in the way that, that we hope they will. And so innovation in both thought and process that can develop new, pro new products, new approaches, new ways of storytelling. And I know this community is thinking about that a lot. I've been learning a lot already this morning. So these are two of the problems around tackling that exclusion, incentivizing inclusion, and also reshaping the news for youth. These are two of the problems that we'll be prioritizing at IFPIM. They're not the only things, but I wanted to give you a flavor of how our strategy is developing. I think in terms of my prior experience, in doing media grant making at Luminate and other places, the things that I, I keep coming back to in terms of what make a great grant application. Firstly, defining your audience. If you're gonna do as Alan soon says, and you're gonna really pay attention to their needs, you need to know who they are first and define them tightly uh, and, and really understand who they are, where they're coming from and how you're serving them. Secondly, explain in the grant application how you're meeting the real felt needs of those audiences. Um, not necessarily your needs as a journalist, which is to be heard on the issues you care about, but on the felt needs of your audience. And thirdly, I think we'll all acknowledge that innovation is needed in this space. We are in a place where we need to redefine the way journalism is done, where public interest media exists, the way media more broadly exists. And so I'm not saying that every application should have a magical silver bullet solution for sustainability, I probably won't believe you if you have one, because uh, many people over the last two decades have tried that. Uh, of course, we want, everyone wants to be thinking about how they're less reliant on, on funders like us and other philanthropy organizations as well. But we do need to be thinking about what, how we move forward. But that innovation could be about not just about business models. It could be about how you diversify your audiences. It could be about how you engage young people, how you set up the conversation so that they, they feel excited to engage. I was just talking to Laura from Matante and 
they're doing an amazing job of that in Colombia, for example. Truly innovative work on, on social conversations. So how do, you, how do you move the needle? Whatever needle it is that you want to move and you think is most important to move, how do you do that? Okay, so um, I can think for 20 minutes. I think that leaves about, about 25. Um, I'm very happy to take questions. Um, and if you want me to clarify uh, uh, anything else about IFPIM, I can do that. Um, but I would also really love your feedback on what you think we're missing when it comes to the way we're thinking about our strategy. We have a number of months before we, we launch and start grant making in earnest. And so we have time to adapt, we have time to change what I've presented. So I would love your input on that. Um, how can we make applications better for you? For example, we started with an open call for proposals um, uh, in part so we could gauge what the pipeline is like and how people would respond whether they were aware. We actually got very few from the Asian countries I listed there. It was by far and away the least represented of all the regions in our open call. A huge number from Ukraine and Georgia, by the way, a lot from Latin America, very, very few from Asia. So what do we do wrong? How can we, how can we be better at that? Do you prefer um, this open call format that many organizations use? Do you prefer trying to get through to an individual at the organization, and which is, they have pros and cons. I would love to hear good experiences that you've had with other funders. Uh, and what advice do you, uh, do you have as we prepare for launch next year? How should we be thinking about the problems we're trying to address? Hi, my name is Trina. Um, I'm technically a media consultant right now. I just left my last job at a tech company. So um, my question is based on what I noticed on a grant application, which I looked at previously, uh, was that I realized that a lot of people don't know how to write grant applications. Mm -hmm. So I think it will be good to teach people how to write proper and good solid applications. That's one. Secondly is the language barrier in API especially. Yeah, we get a lot of people who are interested in applying for grants from like countries that are not native English speakers. Indonesia, say Thailand. And so then what I noticed is that they don't know how to write good grant applications because most of these grantors, I guess, uh, they are they're accepting applications in English. They don't have anyone to review applications in foreign language. So I think that's also another barrier. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. That's good feedback. I think this session is being recorded, so I need to take notes, but I am listening, and I'll listen back to this so I don't lose these insights. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, our open call, we translated into seven languages. Uh, it did slow things down when we had to review them because everything had to be translated back. Not all, all of our languages were covered by staff. Um, but I think it's incredibly important if we get to, to get to be on the usual suspects that we can, we can do that. Thank you. Hello, I'm Shani from Mexico. So we, we actually filled in the application. We didn't get to the second round, but we'll try again. Um, uh, I, think what, I think the application was very clear. Um, I think it's best if it's a, map, a public call, um, okay. because letters and invitation. I mean, the other methods of finding you know doors that don't exist are very hard. Maybe I know it must be really difficult, but I wonder um, if there's any way to have some feedback. I know there must be sort of general formats. I think you cannot respond to everybody like a tailored response, but I wonder if there's any way um, you can. Give feedback as to what was aspects of the application maybe failed or could be um, uh, improved. Yeah, thank you. We have heard that um, from others, and I certainly had that feedback at Luminate as well. Um, when we launched the open call, we had five staff full time um, reading several hundred applications, and so I, it was difficult. But but I think it's the right thing to aspire to, and we'll try and find a way of doing that in a way that's a way that's useful. Hi, uh, this is Sheena. I work for Google, um, the news initiative, so we do a lot of work around funding mechanisms as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how are you thinking about success in terms of the partners that do get selected or publishers that get selected? What are the metrics for success? And a second part question, part um, something that we're grappling with as well, a lot of the feedback from uh, publishers you do fund is the last mile execution of the funding itself, which is just how are you thinking supporting them through implementation if it's tech in nature or just 
strategy is how do you make sure that every dollar is spent and actually benefiting the organization? Yeah, thank you. So in terms of success, I think it depends on the type of media organization. And so if we're thinking about three different types of uh, possible grantees, right? The first are news outlets. Um, and so, and then the second, I'll go through them. The second are um, intermediaries who are trying to support the ecosystem, I would say like Splice. And then the third are maybe national or regional initiatives, potentially policy initiatives, like the National Fund for Journalism I mentioned earlier, right? So success looks pretty different for those three, right? Um, starting with media organizations, I think what I was saying earlier about, about innovation and about truly serving the needs of your audience, finding it tightly and serving those needs, I think is really, really the key. Um, and again, it could be innovation financially or when it comes to the way you think about staffing or engaging your audience in all the innovation around membership models, for example. I think covers that kind of innovation. When it comes to um, those developing the ecosystem, you know, they often have specific sort of needs in mind, um, whether it's about funding or it's about bringing communities together like this. So we would judge that on a case by case. So I am a I am a firm believer in unrestricted core funding um, to organizations because I think that um, the leaders of those organizations are often better placed to determine what they need the money for than we are. Um, now there's a whole process to determine whether what they're doing is, we think, is worthy of the limited funds that we have. But if we do, I don't believe that we should be micromanaging you know, how that's executed. I think if we can, we should be providing an avenue for shared resources. We've had a lot of requests for shared um, publishing platforms and other tech resources that potentially different media organizations have been developing individually, and that's obviously not at the best economy of scale to do that. So if we're hearing voices, the same voice, the same needs from different voices, then we'll, we would consider um, <coughs> building interventions or funding others to build interventions. <coughs> But otherwise, I think we, we want to be able to defer to those, those leading the organizations to do, to do what they think is needed. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Lars from uh, International Media Support. Hi, Lars. Um, so a question regarding FPIN, yeah. uh, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, if when, when you speak about inclusion, have FPIN given consideration to local media? I think we. This crowd is a very sophisticated crowd of media. They have a lot of knowledge also on think on access and funds. I think more can be done. But the real need is really local level media. There are thousands of them. It's also very difficult to develop a strategy for supporting uh, local media financially because of the uh, numerous outlets there are. But any have, if you consider this uh, aspect of, uh, of financial media support. And how are you defining local? Is it Anything that's well, not national or regional? Well, I would say not capital based, mostly mm -hmm. based in provincial district level, in many cases uh, ethnically defined. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. And serving a rural audience. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think it's a very, very good question. Um, and it's one that I think depends on what approach we take when it comes to our, our funding strategy, right? Do you fund organizations that really, really, really need the money? Or do you fund organizations that are likely to survive uh, with your money and with others? Or they're doing work that's easily, um, let's say, elevated to international stories so their impact is more easily seen. And I think it should be a mix. Um, I hope we're finalizing our first round of grantees now. There'll be about, about 10. Um, and I hope. We're planning a, a, a local media organization um, in Latin America. I don't want to be too specific because we need to talk to them first. Um, but it's been part of our thinking today. Um, I think the major barrier there is the amount of money that we're able to raise. If we're able to raise enough money, then I think we can do a lot more when it comes to local media. Um, but I have to be honest, you know, with the war and the recession, fundraising has not been easy. Um, it was easier last year than it is this year. And I'm not, those are very understandable reasons. Um, but we hope that we can, we can, we can make enough significant gains on the fundraising front, but that we can support more local media. Hello, um, my name is Tahir and I come from Pakistan. I'm a journalist. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, what is 
public interest media? What is the criteria if, if you have made it? Because you know, you see that you know it is sort of a buzzword. A lot of leaders are talking about public interest media. So I think we know that legacy media, which is a corporate media, often sidelined with governments, right? So the public interest media stands for people, right? So is there a way, I mean, what is the criteria, uh, but, you know, and um, how to make them sustainable if, if, if they are your clients in, in a way? Yeah, thank you. I think you're absolutely right that public interest media is about what is the media that serves the needs of the publics in the different countries we're talking about, or locales. Um, we, we, we wrote a feasibility study, um, which we published online. It's long, it's about 40,000 words, but it does have a full definition of what we consider to be public interest media. And, and the, it, central to that definition is informing uh, publics with the information, accurate information, they, they need to make decisions in their lives, whether those decisions about um, health or education or um, how to vote or, um, or what's happening in, 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 their, in their context. So I would refer you to that. We have a full definition there. When it comes to how to make um, organizations sustainable, we don't have the answer to that yet. I don't, I don't know that anyone um, does in the media development space. Um, but what we're hoping is that through this journey, we can, we can work together and continue to find innovation, but also systemic solutions. Um, I think one thing that's important to note is that, yes, in the dot-com boom, <coughs> platforms arose and started taking a great deal of advertising revenue from journalism and from other, um, from other, platform, from, from other sectors as well. But this crisis in journalism has not been directly caused by journalists. Journalists did not take radical actions to undermine their own sector. Uh, the world changed. And so anyone who looks for solutions to journalism from purely from within the journalism sector is not looking widely enough. <laughs> because we're not, we weren't the ones who started this problem and we can't solve it by ourselves either. And so it's really, really important for us to keep innovating and keep looking for more inclusive and engaged ways of, of, of growing. Uh, but there'll need to be changes, there'll need to be policy and regulatory changes outside the sector as well, or peripheral to the sector, if we're going to genuinely reach a new paradigm. Yes, got my mic. Hello, Pinesh from Acres Media. My question is, uh, you know, funding normally goes in cycle in order to get some consideration for funding next year, we have to apply this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the crisis comes, it hits you right hard, like in the moment. Um, and I've seen that if we, if uh, you can secure funding if, at a certain level, then you could potentially overcome the crisis, whereas I've seen media going into extinction because of untimely kind of funding. So do you have any kind of solution for that? Well, I mean, I think the first, the first solution is to increase the amount of funding. I think the reason why it takes organizations a while and why certain organizations don't get money is because there are very, very few organizations providing media funding support, um, you know, globally, um, especially outside the US and Europe. And so I think increasing the amount of funds, I hope, can also increase, reduce the trade-offs which have to be made in terms of those organizations. Um, in terms of the speed of funding, we're looking at different solutions there. Um, we have, we, we're likely to, to have a rapid response fund within IFPIM that's designed, um, we haven't designed the criteria yet, but the, the objective of that fund is to seek to respond to um, emergency situations uh, where fund, a large amount of funding are needed quickly. I think actually Ukraine and the recent situation is maybe one example of that, but I understand that there's also organizations in countries where there aren't such macroeconomic factors and it's more about um, the economics at a local level. So um, that's one of the ways we should, we're trying to address that. Hi, um, Alex from uh, Meta. Um, Hi. You, you kind of set out some of the kind of the key areas around grant applications 
uh, innovation, building audiences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you also think about the mentorship, the training, the programs that are needed for organisations to make the most out of that funding and to build a kind of sustainable journey for the long term? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really vital part of the ecosystem, um, and it's something that we, you know, we're looking at who's delivering that and who and what what do we need to do that's actually additive. Um, I know my colleagues from IMS here do a lot of really important work, BBC Media Action, uh, Internews and others do a lot around media training, media support, I know Meta I do it as well as Google. So we need to think about where, if, is, it, is it a capacity issue, is it an expertise issue? It's certainly something that we want to build in over time, but we're trying to see if there's a specific area in which we think we can provide more, uh, more support. So for example, um, in many of the more conversations we've been having around our open core funding, and we've explained why diversity in newsrooms is so important, a lot of people have asked us, well, how do you define diversity? And what does it mean to you? And what targets should we set? That kind of thing. Um, now, I don't, actually, I don't really believe in diversity targets, per se. But I do think that the conversation around, OK, which audience are you trying to represent? How does your newsroom reflect that? And that kind of conversation with grantees, that's proved to be actually quite productive. And so maybe that's an area, I'm not being, I hope I'm not being presumptuous, but maybe that's an area where we could um, do something that is less focused on um, than, than in some other areas. So, um, yeah, I, I would love advice from the group also on what the most acute needs are and, you know, where, where we should spend our resources when it comes to um, technical assistance or venture support or whatever you'd like to call it. Hi, uh, Giulio Pira from Imedia Italy. Um, and yeah, if we're talking about what's missing in the um, 10 years that we've been existing as an independent investigative media outlet, uh, Southern Europe is never on the list of anything. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you look at the Reporters on Frontier Freedom of Information Index, Italy and Greece are far below many countries in Eastern Europe and in Africa as well. And uh, the media funding landscape is terrible. Concentration of power, commissioning with politics is uh, making it extremely hard for us, and yet it's extremely difficult to interest any funders in, uh, in our corner of the world, which is not really a faraway corner, and yet it's a blind angle <laughs> in terms of funding very often. So, um, you know, I, I understand that this might not be the most interested audience <laughs> in, this, uh, in this part of the world, but it's, it's true that uh, Southern Europe never exists in this. And yet the, the media landscape, the, the market, the funding is completely different than, than from Northern Europe. It's really a different continent from that continent. So, yeah, how can we join in? <laughs> yeah. I wish I had an answer to that. Um, I got the same question in Perugia in April, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Um, and, and I think you're right. I think, um, I think it, it, it's very, very difficult. You know, uh, Luminate uh, made the decision to leave um, our funding in Europe and, and the US recently. And the, most, the strongest feedback we got was from Southern Europe and Western Europe, both. Uh, because there is a scarcity of media funding. Some of the funders that we're targeting are EU members. And it's, it's, it's not really possible that for them to fund from their aid budgets fund within the EU. Um, so there's te technically it's also difficult as well as as well as strategically so. Um, but yeah, if I if I come across or if I can if I can be of service in convincing other funders, then I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. So for the intermediaries uh, that one of the sectors that you guys want to support, um, the the work that we do to help media organisations are usually the same kinds of things that we do to help civil society as well. So when you're funding an intermediary, would you also consider the support and impact that we're having on civil society, which then also can, uh, can go hand in hand with media, especially in, in issues of uh, supporting democracy uh, and things like that? Or is it just going to be just like the impact you have on media? And the way it? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to think about that carefully. The, we already have quite, uh, quite a broad mandate. Certainly geogra geographically, our mandate is very broad. Um, and with our commitment of supporting media organizations and intermediaries and looking at national or regional level systemic solutions, that, um, that's a lot of asks and we don't, we don't currently know how much resourcing we'll have to do that. So I think primarily we'll be looking for impact on media. Um, 
but I, I, I really I agree with your premise, which is that um, some of many of the needs facing media organizations, such as expanding their business development, um, organizational development teams, raising money, um, you know, professionalizing HR, those are not specific only to media. Um, and so I hope we, we can work with intermediaries that aren't only related to media to do that. I'm Rosie, you know, I'm from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London. Uh, and we, uh, just following on from your point, have yes. or are losing our Luminate funding. So, uh, a couple of, um, I suppose, points or areas of interest is one is how you, as a CEO of a really um, valuable fund, um, decide geographically what your um, strategy is, because I'm new to the funding world, I'm ex -BBC, and it feels like the funding is moving away, certainly from the UK, or maybe we, we just need to think differently. Um, and secondly, I suppose what your advice would be to those organisations who I think have shown or demonstrated um, good strategic growth, um, excellence in the field, expertise, and also you know, investigative journalism has never been more valuable than that, especially in the UK, if you look at what's happening to UK politics and across Europe as well. So it's sort of, it's trying to navigate a world where actually it's vital globally. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more when it comes to the, the problem statement. Um, I think we've lost about 250 news titles in the UK in the last 14 years, um, which is astonishing. And, uh, you know, the funding, the, the, the small government funds like the Nesta Fund in the UK, their sport journalism are, are, are tiny. I think it's just a couple of million dollars. Um, and so um, I'm a huge fan of the Bureau um, and the, the really important work that you, that you do. Um, but all I can say is that some of the factors that are affecting journalism revenue they're much, are much more severe in countries where, which, are, which don't have national government support and also have much lower CPM rates in advertising, you know? Um, and so if you look at the journalism and the pandemic project work, the most acute revenue losses and needs were felt in lower and middle income countries. And so, you know, with Italy, with the UK, I'm not denying that the needs are, are huge and, and have, are having a massive impact on those countries. But um, unfortunately with our mandate, we've had to focus down um, on where we feel that the revenue losses have been most acute. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Benson Dawood from Salt Podcasting. Um, I work with the business development team and we apply for a lot of grants. We receive a lot of grants. Um, I can perhaps offer a feedback and recommendation regarding the process. Yes. Um, so first of all, I don't think you should either decide to do like an open call or a directly approach. You can do a mix of both. Uh, it depends on where you want to work. Uh, I think both works just fine. Um, regarding the, the the process, I think an element of interacting with the team can complement all the paperwork and applications. Uh, we filled out a lot of applications, however, it's important to meet the donors face to face. You know, schedule a Zoom call, meet the team, not only the CEO or the director or the business development manager, because the actual team that's doing work on the ground are the ones that are able to tell the story much better. We have had very long-standing working relationship with beautiful donors, and uh, most of them are the flexible ones, the ones that really care about maintaining a relationship rather than just dump large sums of money on you know, organizations and they want to see a return on investment, and that's it. It goes beyond that uh, for us and for the donors. So uh, we have a very long-term relationship with many donors around the room, and you know. We love them, they like the work that we do. Uh, it's very flexible in nature. Sometimes they have an open call for core support, sometimes they just, you know, we reach out to them, tell them we need money. So this has been really great for us. Yeah, thank you, that's good advice, and I really like that suggestion. Um, I, I noticed we're at time, um, so I wanna thank you all for, for being here. I'm sorry so many of you had to stand, but I appreciate you, you being here and listening and offering your advice. Um, also a request from me, which is that um, we're fundraising hard at the moment. I know this is not the right route to fundraise from, um, but 
Um, but certainly, um, if you think that IPIM is needed, um, then do voice your support for us because we want to ensure that the donors we're fundraising from uh, understand why what we're doing is important, why it's needed. Um, so we'd appreciate you voicing support um, if you believe in the work we're trying to do. Um, I've heard lots of very interesting things today about what you'd like us to focus on and the importance of providing sort of support beyond money, the importance of flexible funding, um, and thinking carefully through where we work. Um, so I'll take those things back to the team. Thank you so much. You've been listening to a session recording from Splice Beta 2022. Let us know what you think. You'll find us on SpliceMedia.com. This is a Splice podcast produced by Norman Chella at Podchaser. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Google, International Fund for Public Interest Media, International Media Support, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, Luminate Media Development Investment Fund, Meta, and Telemedia. This is Splice.